giving both of these talks independently, is that they reinforce each other. So what I'm going to talk about is how we enable the practice of continuous delivery by using principles of evolutionary architecture. So I want to start with a goal. And the goal that we have is for business agility. And we all know that IT departments and, and the business don't always have the greatest of relationships. And part of that reason is because the business doesn't feel like they can get their features fast enough. Um, as an aside, mostly that's because the business for the last many years has been driving IT departments to be as cost effective as possible, not realizing that agility and responsiveness uh, does not necessarily come at the cheapest cost. So that's one of the problems. But when we talk about business agility, we have this virtuous cycle that we want to establish. And the first is we want a testable hypothesis. We want to be able to go out amongst our, our business folks and find that person with a great idea. But instead of having them say, I've got this wonderful idea, we want them to pose it as a hypothesis, a testable hypothesis that we can build a feature and build in whatever it takes to actually test whether that hypothesis is true, deploy it, see if it worked, and go from there. And so once we have the testable hypothesis, we want to go through our software development cycle, including using continuous design techniques, including thinking about exper uh, 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 experimental design. How are we going to de de design the experiment? Do we need a control group to understand what the results of this test actually are? And then we want to deliver it quickly and release it quickly, more importantly. And there's a whole bunch of agile software development that comes into this particular line item. Um, very, very important, we want to measure the outcomes. The number of software development projects that we've done where they have this wonderful business case that very clearly lays out, we're going to increase sales and we're going to decrease costs, and they never go back and measure it. In part, that's because they have these grandiose figures and probably overlapping projects that could actually, quote unquote, take credit for the same benefit. But we need to measure the outcome. And then we want to repeat this. And so the whole purpose is to be able to allow us to try things quickly, decide if they work, get them out safely as well as quickly, and then if they don't work, pull them back out again. If they do work, build on that. We want all of this based on evidence. So that's a wonderful hypothesis. Wouldn't that be glorious if that's what we could do? What does it really take? And there are several different factors that enter into being able to actually make this cycle work. You have to be prepared to change quickly yet safely. And it's not just you've got the systems in place to do that. And that's a whole lot of what we talk about in terms of continuous delivery. But your organization has to be ready for that. And your users have to be ready for that. And you need to think about what the impact on your organization and your users are if you are going to respond quickly. So everything needs to be prepared to make the change quickly and safely and accept the change quickly and safely. One thing that's absolutely critical is you need visibility. You need to be visibility into how well you're doing. You need to be visibility into how well the change is doing. So this is, again, this measurement, this use of actual data, not my gut tells me this is working, but actual data is critical into both how you're progressing and how that feature is performing. And we want to be able to experiment often. Um, I get in, involved in a lot of discussions around innovation. And very often, people want to measure the success of an innovation program by the number of innovations that have succeeded, or the percentage of innovations that have succeeded. And unfortunately, if you're never failing in this, you're not trying hard enough. You're not taking enough risks. You need to be able to experiment a lot so you can take risks on some of those things that you're not quite sure how it's going to work out. But that might be the winner. And if you're only going to try a few ideas, you're not going to take a risk on one that's a real long shot, even though that might be the cream of the crop in terms of being able to alter the way your business works. We need to think about balancing predictability and opportunities. Lots of people would like to order the world. I can lay out a plan, and in five years, the world will look exactly like I planned it to be. There is a sense in which we do want to be able to predict what's happening. And part of what continuous delivery allows us to do is have less fear of the unknown of deployments. 
However, we also want to be in a position to take advantage of opportunities. And so we need to be able to make those trade-offs. Is this the right time to go off and radically experiment with something new because of the opportunities that has come to pass? And finally, we want to be able to rely on evidence and guess, not guesses. And this comes in in terms of measuring how successful a feature is. This also is going to come up again when we start talking about evolutionary architecture. And we want to make sure that we're making our architectural decisions and our design decisions and our feature decisions on the basis of as, as much evidence as we can practically uh, collect in that period of time rather than relying on guesses. So how are we going to do that? Various techniques, continuous delivery. This is going to provide the structure that allows us to move things across, to be safe, to be, uh, to be quick, but also to make sure that we can undo harm that we have done. Evolutionary architecture. This is how we have to think differently about the software that we build to allow this cycle to take place. I'm not sure there is any way of doing this without using agile software development. I'm, I can't prove it, and being a scientist, I like to be able to prove things. Um, but I, I have seen no evidence to indicate to me that you could do this with a waterfall method. Continuous design. Um, I've been around agile long enough that we've gone through the phase of, yes, agile is good for developers, but not analysts, not testers not architects, not DBAs, and now we're in the, now we need to convince the design community and the user experience community that you don't have to do this big up front either. So continuous design is an important part of this process. And then internal software quality, and this is kind of the underpinning. Uh, we need to make sure that the code itself is able to be changed. And we've learned an awful lot over the last several years on how we can actually ensure that that quality is maintained to the point that we can actually um, improve the software. I'm going to focus primarily on continuous delivery and evolutionary architecture and talk a little bit about internal software quality. And as I said before, there are whole entire workshops on this. So <laughs> we'll go at a high level. So in talking about continuous delivery, I want to start with talking about the last mile of software development. Agile software techniques in general have been optimizing the process of getting software done. But done is not in production. It should be. I know people who say, I don't want to actually sign off a story until not only has it been deployed into production, but I have the data that says whether it's successful or not. There's a good argument for that. There's also a good argument to say maybe we need multiple definitions of done. Uh, but the last software, uh, the last mile, means we're not just interested in optimizing software development as it stands, but this whole notion of how do I know I'm ready to go live. And in calling this out as a separate um, stage, I am, of course, not implying that testing waits till the end or anything like that, but there are different aspects of how we approach testing that we want to consider in addition to the normal testing that we do during the software development life cycle. And then, of course, deployment and into production. And if we're going to speed up the time from Mr. Marketing person coming up with a brilliant idea from having data in my live system that tells me whether or not that's a good idea, we can't just focus on any one of these. In many of the places that we come in, it's not unusual. After development says it's completely finished, including all of the regression testing and all of that, then it goes through an eight-week testing cycle. That means there is no way that cycle from idea to production can be any shorter than eight weeks. Doesn't matter how efficient anything else is. OK. So our objectives are as follows. We want to be able to release to production on demand. That means when the business wants it, not when IT thinks it's all right, not when we can shut the systems down between 1 and 4 AM. We want to be able to re release when the business wants it. When there's something critical that has to go out, that's what we're aiming for. 
if we're going to make that happen, we need to automate pretty much everything. There's no way that a poor person coming in at 3.30 in the morning is going to be able to reliably type everything that's in a five-page deployment script and not make a mistake. They can try really hard. The script can be perfect. But we are human beings. These things should be automated. And I mean almost everything, builds, deployments, rollbacks, migrations, all of those things. That doesn't mean you don't have manual checks if that's what you want. But you want to automate as much of this process as possible because we all know if you want to do something a lot of times, if you want to do something quickly, and if you want to do something safely, you want to make it automated. Now, it's amazing the number of times I talk about continuous delivery, and I'm sure others in this room who have talked about it have the same thing, where someone says, but I, I'm terrified of allowing something to flow automatically into production. The first thing I will say is it doesn't have to flow completely unimpeded by any human looking at it. You can always put in manual big red buttons if you want. But the other thing is just because you can doesn't mean you have to deploy all the time. But isn't it good to know that you can? Because if something critical comes up, you want to know that you've done everything you can to shorten that cycle so that you can get that fix out quickly. I was talking to someone who's basically a hosting provider. And he said, why should I care about continuous delivery? I don't write the apps. I just host them for people. It's like, OK, well, what about a critical OS vulnerability that comes out? Don't you want to know that those things can be rolled out quickly? So what are the different aspects that we have to think about in continuous delivery? And what do we have to do about it? And the first thing is environments. There should be no works of art in environments in your system unless there is an absolutely positively compelling reason to do it. If you've got 12 web servers, they ought to look the same. Unless somebody comes to you with a case that this, this situation is just so weird that we have to make it different. But what is absolutely critical is you want to make sure that you've got enough consistency in environments along your chain from development to production that you don't get surprises. It is incredibly difficult to debug a production issue when you don't have an environment that, that is similar enough to production that you can reproduce it. I've been in situations where there's completely in, inconsistent patching between even different production environments, let alone the test environment. These environments should be standard. You should be able to configure and rebuild an environment in an automated fashion. You should know what all your environments look like. And those, those basic parameters then allow you to more readily promote things, as well as debug things into production. I'm talking about operating system. I'm talking about your systems tools. And one of the issues with this, and this is something that we very often discuss when we're in this, OK, what packages am I going to buy? You want to take a look at the package that you're dealing with and make sure that it's, that it's something that you can script, that you can configure automatically. Because a lot of these tools are not designed to be dealt with from a script. Fortunately, that's improving. And we're getting very clever about how to convince tools that they're actually being driven by a human being, even when they're being driven by a script. But this is something that should be added to every single checklist when you're doing a pro procurement decision. Can I automate this? It's amazing how low that is in many people's uh, checklists until something goes wrong when you're trying to deploy. Related this is configuration parameters. Hopefully, in a crowd that's coming to an Agile software conference, we don't have to say things like, these are the sorts of things that you want to have checked into source control. But you do want to have these things checked into source control. But you also want to think very carefully about what is, in fact, a configuration parameter. And that's where the nothing to access comes in. Some people go completely overboard on what they want to be able to customize in their application. 
So you want to think carefully, what are the critical things that I want to be able to configure at runtime? A lot of these are probably related to your environments. Clearly, you're going to point at a different database with a different da database password when you go from your test environment to your production environment. But you want to be able to manage these things appropriately. You want to make sure that you understand which configuration files go not only with which environment, but what, with what version of the software. And builds. Fundamentally, this pipeline starts with, with the ability to rebuild your software automatically. And you want to think about how you build your software, how you manage your dependencies, how you manage your source control, how you kick off your builds, what does your build pipeline look like with respect to the various tests that, that you're running. Um, it's amazing how many people really don't know how to build something that corresponds to what they have into production. And this is, again, something that makes it incredibly difficult to de debug. Because if you don't know exactly what's running in production, how in the world are you supposed to figure out what, what went wrong? Now, there's some interesting questions that, that come up. Um, and I've had two different clients assert just as strongly the following two positions. And the first is, when you redeploy into production, I want you to deploy everything. Because I know that this thing has been tested as a, as a set. And so I want you to deploy everything is because that's the absolute positive, safest thing you could do. And I've had another person assert exactly the opposite. I want you to deploy the absolute smallest piece of code you have to because I know everything else works. That's the safest thing you can do. Now, I think actually this second point of view was probably right in a situation where you don't know what your environment looks like, you don't know what your configuration settings are, and you don't ab actually know everything that's running in that production system. And in that kind of situation, yes, the safest thing you can do is deploy the smallest thing possible because you've got the, you've got the least chance of disrupting one of these little magic patches that somebody put in at 4 o'clock in the morning to make something work. If you know that your environments are solid, your configuration corresponds, you know what's there, and you've got an automated promotion process, then you're back to this first person's view. The safest thing you can do is deploy as a unit because you know that's what you've tested. You don't have to worry about those other things because they simply can't happen in your, in your environment. And finally, testing. It's your safety net. Um, when I, we're talking about testing in this context, we're talking about an entire suite of things. Of course, we're talking about unit testing. Of course, we're talking about automated functional testing to verify the new features that you're deploying. Yes, we're talking about autom automated regression tests. You may, in fact, want to build some kind of automated smoke test to ensure that once you get into this environment that everything's actually wired up the way it, it should be. You're probably going to want to look at some form of technical testing and performance testing smoke tests, depending on the nature of the changes that, that you're making. All of these things need to be automated. And you want, to, you, you want to think about these test suites in the same way you think about code. It's very easy to get this massive regression test suite that has one functional test for every feature that was ever deployed in the entire lifetime of, of your system. But just like you refactor code as new things come in, you want, to be re you want to be refactoring these test suites. You want to be thinking about what's in those test suites so that that running of that test suite can be as efficient as possible. It's one stage in that pipe. It is one length of time that is standing between you and your feature getting into production. And finally, deployments. You want as much as possible for your deployment to be automated. And that doesn't mean if you've got some really paranoid CIO sitting there who says, I want to be able to hit the big red button before it actually goes into production. There's nothing counter to the principles that we're talking about that will allow you to have a manual step. What you want is to automate the things that can be automated. And if you've got a CIO who says, no, I don't want anything to go into production unless I get a chance to look at something, I don't know what something he might want to look at, 
There's nothing counter to that. But you want to have every one of those stages automated, and you want to have this process of promotion across all of the different environments, whether it be an integration test environment, a technical test environment, some kind of staging environment, or UAT, or a security environment, and all the way into production. You want to use the same deployment process, potentially configured to take advantage of or to take account of different numbers of machines, et cetera. You want that all to be automated because you don't want to have some poor person having to sit there at 3 o'clock in the morning and type things in. So that's essentially, in a whirlwind tour, <laughs> the kinds of things you have to start thinking about in continuous delivery. Now, I'm not saying this is easy. I'm not saying that if you start from a position where maybe you've got source control on a few of your projects, um, you've got a set of tools that you don't necessarily know, you know yet how to script the deployment of because the product vendor thought it was really cool to have this, this neat GUI interface for the administrator to work for. It's not necessarily easy to get from there to this. It is a path. But if you follow that path, what are the benefits? And the, the most important thing is that your deployments are no longer stressful events. They can be fast, and you don't have to worry about them. You've done everything you can to reduce the risk that something's going to go wrong in, into production. Dramatic reduction in errors. You won't have people pointing the UAT database to the production customer database. Things like that happen, unfortunately. Quite importantly, it enables experimentation. Because you can take risks with features without worrying that you're going to bring the entire system down, you can experiment more freely. Much easier to debug production issues because you know what production looks like. And I think most importantly, at the end of a big deployment, there's always the big party. We did it. But the party is not celebrating the features that went out. The party is celebrating the fact that nothing catastrophic happened. Or if something catastrophic did happen, you were able to fix it. We ought to be able to focus on the good stuff in terms of business value that's going out in our deployments, not the fact that we survived another one with our jobs intact. And that's a major benefit of continuous delivery done right. OK. So I've been talking a lot about operating systems and systems tools and environments. What about the code? And this is where evolutionary architecture comes in. This is where we have to start thinking about, from the perspective of my application, from the perspective of my software development process, what do I have to do differently to make it easier to support continuous delivery? And so I want to start by talking about some of the principles of evolutionary architecture. First one is the last responsible moment. I like to call this the latest responsible moment, but it was coined first as last responsible moment. You want to both think about from the perspective of your architecture and your application design what it will mean to evolve it. There's something called Postel's Law that I'll talk about, which has to do with how different parts of your application interact with each other. You want to architect for testability. You want to think about, what do I have to do to make this code, to make this system easier to test? And then there are organizational aspects, and that's where Conway's Law comes in. So let's start with the last responsible moment. You want to delay all of the decisions that you're making until as long as you can, but no longer. You want to delay them to the last responsible mo moment. Now, why would you do that? Well, it seems obvious, but the longer you wait, the more you know. The more information that you have to make a decision between A and B. This also allows you to minimize the technical debt that comes from 
additional complexity that you don't need. This is a different way of thinking about technical data. I first heard this um, in one of Neil's talks. If you decide to put in some kind of heavyweight queuing system early because you think at some point you're going to need all of these features of this queuing system every single day of development that goes up to the point where you actually need that, you've been paying a debt. You've been dealing with a tool that's, too, that's more complicated than, than you needed. And in fact, it's possible that you'll get to that stage where you thought you'd need it and you really didn't. And if you made the decision back here, you've accumulated all of that delay during that time as well as whatever you have to do now, now that you realize that maybe that wasn't the smartest decision in the first place. People often ask, how do I know what the last responsible moment is? And that's where you have to think about what are the critical factors that, that will be impacting my decisions? And you prioritize your decisions on the basis of how they inter intersect with those particular issues. I dealt with a system once, and the person actually said, I don't care about performance. And it's like, you don't care about performance. That's interesting. They, at the time, had a maximum of 80, that's eight zero transactions a day. Maybe that was going to quadruple over the next couple of years. They didn't care about performance. What they cared about is every single one of those transactions was in the hundreds of millions, if not billions, or tens of billions of dollars. He wanted to know absolutely positively that there was no way a transaction could get lost anywhere because every one of those transactions was so valuable. So we, sure, we did a soak test to make sure the thing didn't fall down and there wasn't, weren't memory leaks, but we spent a lot of time thinking about all the different ways transactions could get stuck. And those were the technical tests that we did. If we would have just gone in there thinking, okay, this is a normal, this is a normal transactional system, you know, you know we, we should think about performance, we would have been thinking about the wrong thing. And so we put our effort in what are the design decisions that are going to affect the reliability of the message flow through the system. You think about what your architectural drivers are. What is it that's most critical? And then you look at, for every one of these decisions, in that particular case, does it affect my ability, my reliability of message delivery? Absolutely, okay. Well, we need to focus on this one. Is it performance? I'll worry about that later. So effectively what you're doing is you are setting up the characteristics or the criteria for what constitutes a good architecture for your system. Now obviously there are things about, you know, good taste and all of the separations and all of those things people talk about in terms of architecture. But in terms of the specifics, in your case, this is what is it about my problem that is most important? How important is security? How important is failover? How important is scalability? Those vary drastically from organization to organization. And this is how you decide what kind of experimentation you want to do to get resolution on what you really need for a particular architectural decision. Yes. So in this case, uh, how did it decide the last responsible moment? You said that the concern that is uh, higher priority will tell you what, tell you where to find, how to define the last responsible moment. Take this example. In, in that case, what we did was we moved forward all of the things that had to do with the reliability of the message flow, whether that so um, in part, that was what was our message transport layer? Um, how, uh, how did it handle persisting messages? Uh, what kind of testing we wanted to do? And what kind of uh, capability the uh, vendor could tell us on you know, losing messages? And what our testing showed us is that no, there was in fact a chance for these things to get in the wrong order in a failover situation. So we added a layer of sequence numbers on top of it because the vendor couldn't guarantee, in the case of a failover, that the messages would come in the right order. So on the basis of that, we looked at all of those different decisions and worked on the things that impacted those most, most important drivers and didn't think about some others. 
So we moved those decisions forward because those were the most critical to us. So when you ran out of all those decisions, was when you said that it was the last responsible moment? The last responsible moment for each decision is different. So the last responsible moment in that case for something that, that impacted performance was very late in the day because that wasn't one of our critical drivers. So that was maybe, okay, now, now we're, imp now we're uh, setting up you know, the testing of this particular core. That's the responsible moment for that when we still have time to fix it in case for whatever bizarre reason we couldn't get 80 in a day. Not likely, so that was very close to the end. The last responsible moment, on the other hand, for decisions having to do with that transport were much earlier. So there isn't one moment. There is a moment for each decision. Yes? Can you speak up, please? I can't hear you. Okay, so the question is, does this apply in a particular phase, and is there opportunity lost because you're delaying things? Your selection of the last responsible moment should take into account the opportunities. So um, you're, you're delaying it as long as it's responsible to delay it. If there's an opportunity that you could take advantage of, that is going to enter into your decision about whether it's responsible to continue to wait or to take the decision at, at that time. Um, as for the first, this analysis should be going on throughout the entire process. You're making choices at many different stages. If there's something that you're talking about in an inception that you don't think you really have to nail down in an inception, then don't. Put in your options. You know, if there's something that you think you can delay until release two, don't make a decision until, release, uh, until you start release two. So this, this notion, it, it's, this is related to the previous question. It is not that there is a single last responsible moment. Each decision has this concept of a last responsible moment. And that will differ depending on what the decision actually is and what the specifics of your application is. And that's why you need to have these discussions of what are your, what are your technical requirements? What are the things that are going to be the catastrophic style of failures? Where do you think the pressure points are going to be on your architecture and your, your design? That's what determines your last responsible moment for each one of those individual decisions. OK? OK, thank you. Oh, right. That's part of why you need to design around it. Um, there, actually, hold that thought for about three more slides, OK? And, and, and we'll come back to it. So, so the next thing is, if you are in a system where you anticipate there are going to be lots of changes, and this is probably going to be the vast majority of your system, you want to think about your ability to change that system. Now, I am not talking about the magic silver bullet of architectural reuse, uh, because architectural reuse in general um, means some group of people sitting off isolated from the rest of the development team deciding how these business common objects across an entire enterprise will be reused and writing up all of those things with no connection to how they're actually used and no ability really to understand how, how different potential uses might relate to each other or, in fact, be incompatible with each other. So the first thing is the sensible breakdown of functionality. And sensible in this context is a combination of both what makes sense to you as a technologist and what makes sense to the business person. And one of the things that we're finding in the way business processes are changing and in the way applications are having to change that things that used to be 
uh, different in a business context are now getting combined. And so we need to make sure that we think about, from the context of our, our functionality, what makes sense in, in a business context so we can have these kinds of, of conversations with our business users. So the sensible breakdown of functionality, this doesn't mean everything needs to be the smallest possible grouping. Because obviously that gives you the greatest flexibility of being able to, to rearrange the pieces, but that might be too small. And in fact, we've seen situations where people just took this to the extreme and had so many different micro components that they had a difficult time putting them back together. You want to consider the data life cycle and ownership. One of the things that we are finding in this transition of systems, it used to be that we had these wonderful data silos. And ownership of the data was in these massive applications. And you had this strong correlation between the data and the system. And what we're finding is that many of the applications now, we need a little data from here, and a little data from there, and a little data from over there. And so these questions of data ownership, data lifecycle, data replication are becoming more and more critical. So as you look at your application, you want to think not just about what the, what the boundaries around the functionality are, but what are the acceptable uses of the data? What are the, what are the proper ways to, to give different applications visibility to your data? Who owns it? How often does it change? When should it go away? All of those different questions. Appropriate coupling. I don't say loose coupling. I say appropriate coupling. Because we need to think about, for these individual pieces that we've come up with, and I'm trying to stay away from the, word, the, the C word component, because that's a very overloaded word. So the different pieces of your application, you have to consider what is the appropriate level of coupling. If you've got two, two pieces that have to work together a lot in a very high throughput environment, you're probably going to want to couple them a bit tighter than two things where you've got completely different interaction characteristics. So for each one of these interactions between these various pieces, what is the appropriate level of coupling? If you go through that process of thinking about this, that makes it much easier then to change. If you've got these two things that you do have at a loose level of coupling, it's going to be a whole lot easier to change it might be a whole lot more likely that those things are going to change if they're that disconnected. If you have some business process that is, so in, is in such a tight loop, the probability of that tight coupling affecting you is probably going to be less. It might still happen. None of this is going to ensure that you're never going to have to do more work than might have been possible. What we're trying to do is ensure that you do the least amount probable. Not possible, but probable. Lightweight tooling and documentation, the more weight you can keep off a system, the more flexible it is. Now, developing for evolvability. What I've been talking about so far has been the big picture, the major pieces. Now let's talk about the code. I mentioned internal software quality earlier. There are a whole series of metrics that can help you understand just how difficult is it for you to change your code. And there's two aspects to how difficult it is to, to change the code. And, and the first is the one that is very often forgotten, which is how difficult is it to understand what's going on in the code. Because you can't change it even if you wrote it. You can't change it unless you understand it. And depending on how long ago it was that you wrote it, you probably don't understand it anymore. And then the second is how intertwined, how difficult it is to change that particular piece of code. And that's affected with things like what are the connections between things. So we've developed some, some metrics internally that balance off method length, class length, cyclomatic complexity, fan in and fan out, architectural dependencies, to basically give a measure, we call it toxicity, uh, to give a measure of just how difficult it is to change a piece of code. And these are things that you want to track over time. Now, if you're starting with, a, with an existing system, I very often get asked, do you mean I have to make my entire system perfect? No. 
You want to find where the hot spots are, where the toxicity is the worst, but you want to match that with things like, what's your change log? You know, what files actually change? Um, talk with the business owners. What aspects of the application are likely to change? Things that are more customer facing, are, they tend to be more volatile because our customers tend to want things to change. When they see a new feature over here, they immediately want it in our system. If it's talking to a back-end mainframe that, that is fairly static, probably if it's a mess, it's OK, because you won't have to deal with that mess probably until the mainframe goes away, and then you can probably throw the thing out anyway. So you want to marry how likely it is something to change. Uh, oh, there's a, one other question I very often ask. I try to go to the, uh, the QA folks and say, what makes you the most nervous when the developers tell you they're giving you new functionality in this area? And go to the developers and, tell, and ask them, what keeps you up at night when somebody puts, when, when your name gets put against changing something? What are the areas of code that worry you? Because there's a lot of institutional knowledge in our delivery teams that we need to take advantage of. And then you've got those list of things that worry. And generally speaking, those things that people are worried about are also your hot spots. And so that is probably going to bump things up a little because if they're, if they're actually going to answer that question to you with that module, even though it may not change much, it changes often enough to give them heartburn. And that means it probably ought to be paid attention to. The next thing that's important about metrics is that it's not always the absolute number. We get very asked very often, what's the minimum, you know, what's the maximum level of toxicity you could have? And, you know, like a good consultant, well, it depends. What is important is watching the trend lines, because this can tell you a lot. This can tell you about pressure that's, that's being put on your development team. If the trend is going the wrong way, it can give you an indication that there are other things going wrong in your development process. It can perhaps tell you that a decision that you made is introducing a series of problems. We, we had one example where a project manager was changed over, and the metrics plummeted. Everything was getting worse. It allowed a conversation to happen. OK, new project manager, what's happening with the dynamics of, of the team so that something can be corrected? So in many cases, it's not so much the absolute number as the trend line that you will see. Now, reversibility. This is, this is the slide I wanted you to wait for. Reversibility is basically, to the extent possible, you can extend your last responsible moment if it's easy to change your mind. And there are lots of things that we do to make it easy to change your mind. We put in abstraction layers that are, that are at a more functional level so that we can swap one queuing system for another more readily. There are all kinds of things that we do when we develop code. We put in symbolic variables. Lots of things that allow us to change our mind. So whenever you're looking at these particular decisions, is there a way that you can make it easy to change your mind? And as long as that doesn't cost too much, that's probably something that's worth doing. If it's a decision that, that you're still not really sure is right, you feel like you're taking a risk making the decision, but you feel like you have to make it now, it's probably worth paying a little bit more to make that decision reversible, add in a layer of, of abstraction, do something to make it easier to change your mind. You don't want to do this always, or you end up with this house of you know, ability to reconfigure, which is excessive. All of these things come down to using good judgment. I did have somebody once tell me that, 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 that Agile is basically either telling you to be hyper-responsible or hyper-careless. And it's neither one of those. We have a lot of responsibility to make particular de decisions. And this is one of them. Now, post dose law. This is talking about when we think of these two different pieces that have to communicate with each other, how should we set up the communication? And there are all kinds of debates about we need a universal or ubiquitous uh, business language for all of our messages that, that flow on our enterprise buses. There are all kinds of, how do I design messages? How do I design APIs? 
This is what this law is talking about. And the first half of the law is be conservative in what you send. The more you send out, the more people are going to expect you to continue to send that out. So one school of thought is whenever you put out a message about an object, put out the entire object. Well, you've just exposed a whole lot of information about your internal implementation that you probably don't want out there. So be conservative in what you send. But be liberal in what you receive. If all you need to pull out of a message, an object, a database, a whatever, is a name and zip code, don't parse the whole thing. Don't validate the whole thing. Pull out your name, pull out your zip code, and go on. Because that means people can add, subtract, change everything else that you don't care about, and you don't have to change a thing. The only time you have to do anything is if they change something that you need. You can't get away from that one. I can't magically protect you from every change that anybody is ever going to make. But we can be protected from the changes that shouldn't break our code. If all I need is name and zip code, my code should not break if they make a change in the customer coding. I don't need it. Why should that break my code? So be liberal in, in what you receive. Now, unfortunately, this does run counter to some, some um, expectations about protections. Well, if I'm getting a message, I need to validate that the message is, is, is correct. Well, why? If you are the consumer of a particular piece of information, why should you be validating that all of these other things that you know nothing about? Why, sh why should you be doing it? It's an improper delegation of responsibility. So be liberal in what you receive, and that way the only time you have to change is if they change something that you need. Only validate what you need. This should hold for any kind of information exchange. You want to make sure that any time you're interacting, whether it's a, a message, any other kind of, of, of uh, inputs, databases, if you can get away with it, every kind of information exchange, you want to follow these policies. And you also should probably think about what you have to do with respect to versions and such just in case some of these things do change. Because as I said, we can't be protected against all changes. Architect for testability. If there's one single point from the evolutionary architecture part of this talk that I want you to remember, it's this one. Because what we've seen is that the more people think about testability, the more people think how easy is it going to, for me to verify how the system works, the better architected the system is. You very often find this in code development as well when you think about how testable is a, is a, is a piece of code. You get the properties that you want out of a good system when you focused on when you're focused on how easy it is to test the system. This leads you to things like using your messaging infrastructure to send and receive messages, not to put business logic in there, because it's very difficult to test logic that's in places like this. Similar to stored procedures, it's very difficult to test business logic that lives in, in stored procedures. You want to think about how you uh, componentize in terms of what functions are being delivered to the business. If you think about behavior-driven development, if you think about acceptance test-driven development, all of these things are talking about what is the behavior of the system that is being delivered to the user. If your architecture is designed around technical layers, it's going to be more difficult to test these end-to-end -end functional scenarios. So think about your architecture from the perspective of what makes sense in the way that you're going to test, and the way you should be testing has to do with how the system is going to be used. You want to be testing at multiple levels, obviously. One very 
uh, helpful style of test. I call it a contract test. When you are interacting with another system, particularly another system that's under development while you're under development, you need a way of finding out when they're changing one of those things that you rely on. Now, very often, the role of a, of a good enterprise architect is to know what are those assumptions that these different systems are making of each other so they can kind of keep an eye on making sure that doesn't break. It's not a very scalable process. So what we advocate here is you use tests. If I'm working on a system and you're working on a system, I give you a set of tests to run against your system that document the behavior that I'm expecting from you. And this is how I am documenting my assumptions about your system. And that way, you know if you've changed something that's going to impact me. And if you think about from the perspective of agile development, what testing is all about, it's one way to trigger a conversation. When something fails, you know you ought to go ask a question. So if, you, if one of my tests breaks, you know to come to me and say, our functionality is now changing in such a way that your system has to change. Documenting the assumptions that are being made about the system so that we know when those assumptions have been broken at the earliest possible moment rather than waiting until we get to some kind of integration test environment, which if we're doing continuous delivery won't be that long. And of course, this is another intersection with continuous delivery. If we're going to have all of these different tests, if, if we're going to think so consciously about testing that we're going to worry about it in our architecture phase, worried of, at, at our design phase, we want to have the right kind of build and test automation support to make this thing easy. And then Conway's law. Although this is the technical side, every once in a while we do have to think about organizations. Organ an organization's design reflects itself in the products that it builds. Um, there was a great story that, that Martin said once. Um, he was talking to someone who was responsible for building a compiler. And they had collected this, this hotshot group of people that were located in four different labs. And this guy was smart enough to say, therefore, I will have a four-pass compiler. Because there's no way <laughs> that he was going to be able to build anything else that didn't reflect the reality of the organization. He had people sitting in four different places. Whether he wanted one or not, he was going to end up with a four-pass compiler, so he had to figure out how to architect that four-pass compiler. Very often, you will see that if you have organizational silos that don't talk to each other very well, that their modules don't interact very well. And conversely, if you have two organizational units that do work well together, you don't see that same kind of organizational breakdown. So you can see in a system some of the pathologies that exist in your organization. Silos often result from broken communication. And this is why one, another one of the reasons, if you go back to this architect for testability and these business sensible components, if you start thinking about, I'm going to have a front end team, and I'm going to have you know, a middleware team, and I'm going to have a database team, you've now set up that every single thing that you write is going to go across silos. That's almost a recipe for failure because you've got so many broken communication channels. You need to think about these things in such a way where you're optimizing the communication or your system is going to reflect the pathologies of your organization. And so in summary, if you don't want your product to look like your organization, you either have to change your organization or your product because they will reflect each other. It's, it's almost, you know, I think it's one of those fundamental laws of nature. OK, so evolutionary architecture. One of the, one of the debates that, that, uh, that I've had with Neil about this is he talks about emergent design, and I talk about evolutionary architecture. And so there's this question, of course, difference between design and architecture, but I'm actually more interested in the difference between emergence and evolutionary. And the way I think about this is that 
an emergent system is kind of self-organizing. And when we talk about emergent design, you're looking at the way these things are changing on their own and deciding what you want to, what you want to extract, what you want to impose in terms of order as a result of what you're seeing in terms of how things are changing. When I talk about evolutionary architecture, I want to go back to those architectural drivers that I was talking about. One way to think about this is this is a fitness function of the architecture for your organization and for that system. And this is a way of knowing as my architecture changes, as I add new applications, as I change various aspects of my system, am I improving the fitness, if you will, of my architecture. And I'm going to characterize that in terms of those architectural drivers. What is necessary in terms of scalability? What is necessary in terms of security? And every time I make one of these decisions, every time I move my architecture in a particular way, I need to check it against those drivers to ensure that the decisions that I'm making still reflect what I've said is the right the characteristics of the right architecture. This is the role these central architecture groups should be playing, is, is helping the development teams understand what are the characteristics that this system needs to meet in order for it to be an appropriate player within the broader enterprise estate. Delay your decisions as long as you can, and that means you might have to, to build things into your application to allow you to change. This reversibility that we were talking about it doesn't always come for free. Where possible, though, if you can delay that decision, you can have the information that you need to make the right decision. One of the, one of the things I often find when I'm brought in to, to sort of mediate between a development team and a central architecture group, what I often hear from the development team is they're picking these things that don't make sense. And usually, that's because there hasn't been the information flow of, OK, these are the things that you need. You know, these are the problems that we're facing, and therefore, these are the characteristics of the tool that we'd like you to select to solve our problem. The architects are very often in a situation where they don't have that information. So you want to delay decisions so that you can collect the right information that allows you to make the right decision. It, do, it, it doesn't sound like rocket science, but you'd be amazed at how there's such organizational pressure to pick the tool early. But that very often is a mistake. Understand the various forms of technical debt. Some of this can come from tools. Some of this can come from the very conscious decision that we make to push something out the door because it's necessary to, to get it out the door. Take a look at the technical debt that you have with respect to continuous delivery. Where are, those, where are those systems that are relying on these bizarre configurations and what can we do about this? Where do we have holes in our automation process? Where do we have holes in our testing process? Technical debt takes many forms. We often think of it as just emphasis on the maintain. We talk a lot about making tests, doing tests, automating our tests. But just like our code, this is an asset that needs to be maintained. We need to think about what does our test suite in the large look like, just like we think of not just what a particular method or a particular object looks like, but we think about our application. We need to think about our test suite in the large as well and maintain it, not just create it. OK, it's not quite it. I alluded to, to, the, to this earlier. Um, for several years, boards and management committees have put pressure on IT organizations to lower their cost. And how do you lower cost and lower risk? You lock things down. You make it hard and harder to change. Because if you don't change anything and it was working before, chances are it's still going to work. And so IT departments were pushed in this direction. And now all of a sudden, the business wants all these new features. And they want them fast. And they're irritated at the IT departments because they can't change fast enough. An organization that is good at stability is not going to be good at responsiveness. It's a different mindset. It's a different organization. There are different metrics that you use to measure how good you are. So, 
these two organizations are incompatible. So we need to think about how we are going to change the way we approach problems so that the part that needs to be responsive can be responsive. Now, ironically, continuous delivery applies to both the responsiveness side and the stability side. Because regardless of how hard you try, even those things that you don't want to change very much, well, Microsoft is going to come out with a new operating system. Oracle is going to come out with a new database system. You are going to have to change these systems. And what I find fascinating about continuous delivery is it both allows you to go fast because of the automation, because on the focus of I'm going to optimize this time from feature to production, but it also allows you to reduce risk. Because if you've got these things automated, you know that each time you do this, it's going to happen the same way. And so whether you are a, a stable IT department where your job is really to just keep the lights on on things that have been running the same way they've been running for the last five years, continuous delivery is just as useful because for those times you do have to change, you have very low risk. This is the, the way to increase stability is to reduce the risk when you do have to change things. And yet continuous delivery also helps this other kind of organization by allowing you to move quickly, by allowing you to focus on, OK, I'm going, I'm going to intentionally destabilize this system, but I want to, I'm going to provide this stable foundation so that I know when something goes wrong, I can isolate it as quickly as possible. So how do we achieve then business agility? We architect for real adaptability. We think about what can we do both to take advantage of those things that we can see, but also make it easy to take advantage of opportunities that we haven't seen yet. And this is, a, this is where that preemptive reuse really breaks down. The environment that our systems are operating in right now are changing so rapidly that no matter how good you are, no matter how well-intentioned you are, you are not going to be able to know what your customers are going to want nine months down the line, let alone what kind of code is going to be required to deliver what your customers want nine months down the line. So rather than trying to predict, just like, just like XP says, embrace change, architect your system to be adaptable, and then keep them poised for change. Keep your, keep your eye on technical debt. Try to take care of it so you're always in a position to be able to change. Lower the cost and risk of experimentation. Continuous delivery, this is a huge part of this. You want to know that you can put something out, and if things go wrong, you can back it out. You want to know that you can put things out quickly and not, and not jeopardize the other aspects of your system. You want to maximize the visibility and feedback so that your business understands what's going on. You understand what the business priorities are. You have a way of demonstrating the progress that you're making. You have a way of supporting any arguments you might have about the risks that are being taken. This is, having all of this information available provides you the data and the arguments to have real discussions with your business to understand what their priorities are, and importantly, to help them understand the risks that you're worrying about. We need both to lower the risk and increase the responsiveness. And that's, that's a lot of what we've been talking about here. Continuous delivery does this for us, and evolutionary architecture does this for us. The testing safety net, making sure that you've got things properly encapsulated, so changing something over here won't necessarily affect something over there. Looking at our message exchanges, all of these things go towards lowering the risk and increasing the responsiveness of the system. So my assertion is that by combining the techniques of evolutionary architecture, including, including aspects of emergent design, including everything we know about agile software development, everything we know about unit testing, all of the automated testing, combining that, 
with what continuous delivery has brought in terms of how we ensure that we can, in fact, take an idea, drive it through the process, test whether it's doing what we thought it would do, and react accordingly. Those two things combined put us in a position where we can start being responsive to what it is that the business wants us to achieve, rather than just always running to keep up. Any questions? Yes. Uh, can you address that? Okay, I'm, I was, was talking at, at a different level. Um, there, there are lots of different approaches for trying to enable um, basically simultaneous development of, of, of different pieces of code. So feature toggles, for, for, for one example, um, you're working on adding something, you want to release, so you want to keep it turned off for a little while. Um, there are many different approaches. You've got people, some people will advocate feature branches. Um, if they're short enough lived, maybe that's okay. Um, feature toggles are more useful when you've got uh, functionality that crosses a, a broader range of a system, so it's, it's more difficult to control, if you will, um, what you include, what you don't, don't include. Um, to me, those are less architectural decisions and more design decisions. Um, and that's why I was focusing more on the architectural level. Um, but you know, there's, we're, there's still a lot of work going on to, to try to, uh, within a particular organization, what is the right approach to keeping a feature isolated enough so that you can determine when, in fact, it gets deployed? But, uh, doesn't it add to business agility when you selectively expose certain features to a demographic segment? And you know, uh, that way, your uh, ability to respond to change as a business uh, definitely uh, improves. So I, I feel that it's a part of business agility. The, the ability to selectively roll things, uh, the ability to do A-B testing, uh, those are all definitely aspects of, of business agility. There's, there, there's no question. As, as I said at the beginning, you know, each one of these topics could be an entire workshop, and I'm trying to cover both of them in, in, in 90 minutes. But um, w one of the interesting things um, that I think is finally getting more attention is you know, when, when you want to start doing A-B testing, how do you, you know, you, you effectively have to support both things somehow. How, how do you support that? How, how then do you ensure that you get the right kind of data testing, et cetera? So there, there's a whole realm of questions on, on okay, I, I want to expose this feature to this population, that feature to that population, and here's my control group. How do I manage all those things? There, there's, a, there's an entire range of, of issues that, that, that come around that. Agreed. <laughs> Uh, hi, a quick question. Uh, we had one over there first. Yeah, sorry. Uh, what do you think the disadvantages with the continuous delivery and uh, what do you perceive as the risks or the operational risks uh, going with the continuous delivery? Apart from the infrastructure side. The operational risks of going with continuous delivery? Yeah, uh, or, or the disadvantages. Um, Personally, I think there are a whole lot more operational risks not going with continuous delivery. However, the transition can be more of a problem. As I said, there are a lot of tools that are often used within operations departments that are not necessarily ready to be scripted. So there's a fair amount of work to get those things scripted. If you have different environments that are set up as these sort of works of art, you've got to figure out, well, how much of that is necessary and how much of that was, was a systems person just you know, having fun experimenting. So you have to be able to move those applications to fit in those standardized environments. So there's, there's a lot of work um, that, that goes from moving towards that. Um, 
but as, as I said, I think it actually reduces the operational risk once you get there because you know what you're dealing with on all, all of your different machines. You have a mechanism by which the environments, you know that this environment looks like this. Um, and therefore, if something goes wrong, you can figure it out because you know what's there. So um, there, are, there are challenges, organizational and technical, in moving to this. But I think you actually reduce your op operational risk once you're there. Thanks. So uh, we had a question. You, sorry. Yes. But they're not necessarily your users. If, if, if your hypothesis is something in a customer-facing system, yes, you might have focus groups and such. Yeah. But your true measure of done is you thought that this was going to increase sales or decrease drop-offs or whatever metric that you put in. And you can only measure that once you go into production. And so from the perspective of did the business get what, it's at, what it asked for, you won't know that until it's actually in production. Yes, you've got users and you've got acceptance tests and all of that, but, but the, the, the true test of whether or not this is complete is did it, a, did it satisfy the initial hypothesis? And I think, that's, I think that's the shift, the mental shift that's made rather than the business cases we used to write and, oh yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to be able to decrease our customer support staff by 75% and they never measure it. So that, that's the distinction. So, Rebecca, you talked about uh, feature branching and uh, feature toggle. And uh, you said that, uh, you know, we, we, we could do feature branching if the feature is, uh, it does not take long enough to uh, build the feature. What do you mean by long enough? What would be the definition of that long enough? Um, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> um, certainly, Personally, I wouldn't want it to, to, to go outside the bounds of an iteration. Um, and I probably wouldn't want it to go too far outside the bounds of, of, of a day or two. Um, the problem that you get in feature branches are seductive. Because you have this ability to live in your own branch and make whatever assumptions you want to make about the world. And the longer those things stay out there, the more possibility you have for your view of the world to diverge from the real world. And so, you know, um, feature branches are nice for experimentations and spikes. You know, you might want to isolate something, um, but the longer something is isolated, the more problem you have when you're trying to bring it back into the main line. And the whole idea behind continuous integration was you are finding out as soon as possible what you did to break somebody else or what somebody else did, did to break you. And if you're living on a feature branch, you can be all happy because your build is passing, but you don't know how your view of the world reflects anybody else's. But do tools like Git, uh, which have distributed a repository, I mean, do they help in such cases? We have run a lot of dis distributed projects using a single code repository and using the, um, the same rules and expectations around continuous integration. Um, you do sometimes have to think about it if, you're, if you're, you know network connections are not very good. Um, but I've, I've seen that unfortunately used more as, as an excuse to you know, let, let people play by themselves. Um, rather than, than a legitimate cause for concern. Um, what we have sometimes done um, is you might use a local repository for a team, and then those things get synced up at the end of the day to, to resolve those, those, you know, if it's easier from a, from a di distributed perspective. Um, but to me, there's usually better ways of, of approaching the problems introduced by, by a distributed development team 
than letting the teams run, run uh, independent of each other. In particular, since if they're physically distributed, they're likely not to be talking enough to really know what's going on between the two, and that just increases the need to make sure that you're bringing the, those code bases together as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so you talked about uh, silos. Um, what I wanted to know was, uh, could you suggest some ways to basically break the silos so that your productivity is not impacted? And uh, could you Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Uh, could you, this is with, with reference to silos, could mm -hmm. you talk about some ways by which you could, one could uh, break silos to increase productivity? And secondly, how do you handle cases where your product has, is, uh, has a component which is research intensive and there is a black box and there's a team of scientists who are actually working in a silo mode to give you models, uh, like a data mining model, then how do you kind of incorporate that silo into your regular uh, productivity workflow where you have your web server team, your database team, all uh, working in, in, uh, in concert? So how do you incorporate a research intensive component um, and apply Agile so that you're able to still get productivity? Yeah, that's that, that that that's what it seems. So you're you're talking about basically you've got a research team that's going off and trying to to discover something interesting in a piece of data, and then once they find it, how how do they how do they turn it over? Right. So before you can go to production, you need some solutions from a research team. Um, they need to get you some data mined patterns or something like that. And nowadays, many projects have some aspect which is kind of going into a hard science or, or a research mode. So you have a bunch of people who are experts working on that. And uh, it's, you can't apply this no silo rule in that case, because these are people who know that domain. They might be even PhDs in that area. So how do you kind of uh, incorporate that aspect also into this workflow? Well, uh, the, da the data scientists that we have working for us on our teams probably wouldn't say that just because they have a PhD doesn't mean they have to be in a silo by themselves. So, you know, I, <laughs> and you know, we, we, we have people who are doing exactly that. They're, you know, they're the PhDs in mathematics and statistics, and they're looking at these, and these pieces of data, and they're working very nicely with the, with the delivery teams. Um, you have to have a conversation on, you know, okay, well, what are, what's the input into this model that they're building? Um, they might be building their model in R, and then you, you have to figure out, okay, well, how are you gonna reflect the actual implementation of, the, of that model in, in your production system. Um, so you have conversations about what's going to come in and what's going what's to come out. And, and just like you've got, you know, we advocate, okay, you know, the DBAs who know a lot about tuning databases are experts too. And, you know, they ought to be working with a team. The data scientists need to be working with a team. You know, the, the user experience people need to be working with, with a team. There is a... Um, there has been this progression in Agile where it started with, okay, well, it's okay for developers, but none of the rest of the roles. And then we brought QAs and BAs into the mix, and you know, the PMs we brought into the mix, and DBAs are slowly starting to come into the mix, and architects are slowly starting to come into the mix, and user experience people are perhaps a little further behind, and the data scientists are going to be the same. Um, but you know, from the more general question of, of silos, I very often hear that, okay, well, we've got this pool of people with, with a specialized resource or a specialized skill, and six teams need them, so, so how, how, how do we handle that? Well, you don't handle it by making a black box that is a silo and tossing effectively non-prioritized jobs into that box and having all of these delivery teams waiting for, for an unknown period of time for something to come back out of the box. You know, there are other ways of doing resource management than, than just do, uh, u using a silo. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we talked a lot about continuous integration and uh, deploying those features to production when the business needs it. But uh, most of the uh, multinational companies that we work with have a specific uh, window where they deploy the application to production. Mm -hmm. And it usually happens not more than twice a year. So having said that, how are we going to uh, make sure that uh, the features are getting deployed and uh, we are checking the vulnerability of the application and getting the feedback from the customer when we know that the production deployment is going to happen only twice a year? 
part of our mission in continuous delivery is getting more of those organizations who only deploy twice a year to deploy more, deploy more often than that. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and one part of that is very often they only want to deploy twice a year because it's too risky to deploy more often. Their internal test cycles take that long. They can't deploy more often. In fact, we, we very often get called in to organizations like that because they want to deploy more regularly. They just don't know how to, to change. So um, th that's, that's one that I think you know, we, we are definitely trying to change. The, 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 other, the other thing I would think about that, particularly from the perspective of uh, continuous d delivery, is I, I, can't, I can't emphasize enough the fact that you know, we talk about this a lot in terms of this is how you can get things out fast, but it's also important that this is how you can get things out and lower the risk. Um, and that's a message that a lot of, you know, even the, you know, uh, the, the organizations that are not deploying as often, they still would like to know that when they do it, you know, they don't have to have this, this tense situation where they're not sure whether or not it's going to work. And once you get that part in, then you can start moving a little bit, bit further out and, okay, well, what can we do around the internal testing cycles to make it that you can deploy three times a year instead of two and then four and then all of a sudden they start to really like getting things out more frequently and, and then it sort of steamrolls from there. Yes. Hi, Ribita. This was a very interesting session. I found that very interesting part was when you mentioned the uh, cost control is uh, uh, to the, towards the stability, but the value creation happens, and it, it is mainly to responsiveness. So there's a, a balance between both of them, and you try to emphasize that with continuous delivery, we can perhaps have a less risk and most responsiveness. But do you suggest something else as well? Or is this, the, uh, is this the only thing that can enable that to happen? Or is it a number of factors that you have found in addition to the continuous delivery that will help uh, reach that golden balance? Um, well, I think the other way to reach the balance is you've got to separate out the problems. There are aspects of an organization um, that it's like electricity. You know, you don't have a steering committee to decide which, you know, power company, you know, and, and how you manage your, your, your power. Um, and there are some aspects of the IT estate that really are utility functions. And then you've got the things that really distinguish your, you from your competitors. What is your business differentiator? What aspects of your technology system? And those you want to have stable enough so that they're not falling over all the time, but responsive. And then the, the one critical part of that is you have to have the ability for things to move across that barrier. It used to be, back a long time ago, that the ability to communicate by email to a customer service representative was an incredible differentiator because not too many people did it. You know, and so email at that point and that email functionality was, was a critical part of, of the differentiation. Now everybody takes email for granted and, and people are now talking about things like, oh, well, we've actually got this little intelligent agent that can, you know, isn't really a person, but you kind of think it is because it will you know, take you through all these steps and hopefully be smart enough to send you off to a person when you're confusing it. So you know, some of these things can move across that barrier, but, but fundamentally I, I do think we have to start thinking differently about those aspects of our business that differentiate, and you can't manage those in the same way you want to manage you know, your accounts receivable and your accounts payable, because you know, generally accepted accounting principles haven't changed in a while. Sarbox kind of you know, set, everything, set everything on fire for a little while, but that's kind of calmed down. So you want to think about those kinds of applications in a different way than you think about the ones where you actually are differentiating yourself from your from your competition. Right. I found that a very interesting point because most of the companies, that is a trick question to be answered. If we can reach to that answer, uh, it is a success. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. 
And I think we've already run over time. Um, I'll hang around for a little while, but uh, we'll also let you go for your break. Thank <laughs> you.